Childhood obesity is emerging as an important new age epidemic which has significant short and long term implications in terms of health of both the child and the society. It is extremely important for pediatricians to understand the nuances in terms of evaluation and management of children with obesity. Importantly, vast majority of children who come to us with obesity do not have a pathological cause but represent physiological variation because of lifestyle factors. However, a subset of children will definitely have a pathology which needs evaluation. So the crux of evaluation in terms of clinical and biochemical assessment is to identify children who are associated with a pathological cause of obesity and to identify complications associated with obesity which would make it easier with the use of limited investigations to approach, evaluate and manage a child with obesity. So we have this 14 year old girl who is a common presentation who has a weight of 75, is reasonably tall, has a significant BMI of 32 and what we see is that she actually has uh, already developed uh, diabetes with a uh, blood sugar fasting of 120 and 2 hours post glucose value of touching just the borderline 200. She has high cholesterol and elevated SGPT suggestive of a non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. So this is clearly a situation of ticking time bond and even though she is smiling now, her future is not really that bright. Obesity has really become an epidemic and particularly in children and it has started from US and what we can see is that the percentage of overweight in boys and girls really plummeted very rapidly, had a very rapid rise over the last decade or so with the numbers really going up and there were doubling of rates of more than 20 years with a tremendous health impact and what we are seeing now is that from a generation X we have a generation XXXL which is really causing significant impact on not only the longevity of the society but also the productivity and costs associated with that. If you look at the Indian picture we see that there has been significant elevation of obesity so in a period of around 5 years there was a 60% increase in the prevalence of obesity which is much more than the inflation rate that we encounter in most cases. Figures are increasing and as we can see the numbers are going up and in our area also the figures are around 18-20%. to 20%. So obesity is becoming a big problem and if we do not tackle it now, it's going to be a big issue subsequently. So obesity is from a clinical perspective either exogenous which could be considered as a constitutional or a lifestyle related obesity which is associated with imbalance between the amount of energy which is taken and the amount of energy which is spent or pathological which is caused by certain situations or disease. Vast majority of children, around 90 to 95 percent children present to us with exogenous constitutional obesity which is characterized by normal stature, development, puberty and facies. While those children who have growth failure abnormal developmental status, associated stigma or dysmorphism are more likely to have a pathological cause of obesity which in turn could barely be classified into an endocrine, genetic or secondary causes. Endocrine causes of obesity are not very common but they have significant implications in terms of long term impact and should be considered in children who have growth failure and obesity. Genetic and syndromic causes are often identified based upon classical facial features, hypotonia, visual complaints or other associated problems in terms of puberty. So the key question that a pediatrician has to answer in a child who presents to us with obesity is whether it is really obesity, is it normal versus disease and finally what is the cause and once we have identified it as obesity what is the effect of the obesity. So the first question obviously is, is it obesity and what we need to understand in this regard is that obesity is not just increased fat, it's not just increased weight but actually increased fat and what we are looking at is adiposity. From a clinical perspective we talk about uh, parameters like body composition or impedance or DEXA based assessment that would be too difficult in resource intense so that's why we have to use surrogate markers like body mass index which is a marker of adiposity and waist circumference which is a marker of abdominal obesity 
which is a significant risk factor as far as long term complications are concerned. Now, BMI is a often used and abused criteria which has both positive and negative associations, but what we can say is that it is the best we have amongst the various parameters as far as clinical parameters of obesity are concerned. So, BMI levels more than 85th percentile are considered for overweight, while those above 95th percentile for the age and gender are considered to be obese. We how we need to understand is that BMI is not an absolute marker of adiposity as was published in this very wonderful uh, Vignet, the YY paradox of two individuals, Dr. Yarkinik and Dr. Yutkin. The two who have been actively participating with regards to research in the field of adiposity and what we see is that both individuals have a similar BMI but there is a huge difference of at least two and a half folds in that Dr. Yuragnik had a much higher level of body fat compared to Dr. Yutkin and that was related to their lifestyle and physical activity. So what criteria should we use for BMI and we all know that BMI has a J curve association with mortality so there is some increased mortality in lower BMI but it suddenly starts increasing linearly from around 30 is the figure for the western population. So conventionally the criteria in the west is more than 25 is considered to be overweight and more than 30 is considered to be obese. In Indian setting, however, it has been found that the, for the same level of BMI, we are at a higher risk of developing cardiometabolic syndrome and therefore cutoffs of 23 and 27 are used for overweight and obesity. And similarly, we need to look at uh, criteria for the body mass index as well for Indian children. And now we have recent criteria which extrapolate back from the 27 equivalent and 23 adult equivalent which give us information about the actual criteria for obesity. So when should we worry about a child who comes to us with obesity? So if a child is very high as far as BMI is concerned, obesity is if the is more than 95th percentile we need to be concerned. If you have a child who is overweight, we also need to be concerned if there are associated family issues or complications. And finally, a child who is really actually crossing percentile lines as far as BMI is concerned, we also need to be concerned because this could be a marker of acquired cause of obesity. So somebody who is very fat, fat with associated with complications or very rapid weight gain needs to be evaluated in this regard. Once we have confirmed that the child has obesity, the next question is whether it is a physiological or a pathological cause of obesity. And in this regard, we need to consider the pointers to pathology, which include delayed growth, puberty or development, dysmorphic features or visual complaints. So now we have a 12 year old boy whose height is 160, weight is 70, was found to have a TSH of 7.91, advised thyroxine. And this is the growth chart. This is the height and this is the weight. So does this child have hypothyroidism? And this is a very common presentation, a very common referral. When we do a TSH in a child with obesity, we find it to be marginally elevated. It's important to remember out here that this child actually has a height age which is advanced as far as chronological age is concerned. So he's tall and obese, a direct indicator to a physiological or an exogenous or a constitutional obesity going against the diagnosis of hypothyroidism. Marginal elevations in TSH between 5 to 10 are actually the effect of obesity through the hypothalamic mechanism and not really the cause of obesity. So this child does not require any treatment. It is not hypothyroidism. What about this child? 12 year old boy, height is 130 and weight is 58. Screening tests were done which were normal and the child was reassured. So let's plot on the chart and we see that this child is actually short and plump and this is clearly a marker of endocrine obesity. Obesity and growth failure has very limited causes including Cushing syndrome, hypothyroidism, pseudohypoparathyroidism and Turner syndrome. So in this case we need to be very very cautious this is not the run of the mill case of uh, path, uh, physiological obesity in which the growth is advanced and therefore we need to be careful in this regards. 
So high TH is definitely compromised and when we did evaluation it turned out to be Cushing syndrome. So once we know it is a pathological cause, the next question which comes to our mind is what is the cause of obesity? And in this regard, we have to evaluate, look for features of coarse skin, hypotonia indicating hypothyroidism, hypertension, hirsutism, buffalo hump, central adipocity, myopathy, stria, which are indicative of uh, Cushing's, which require the overnight suppression test for Cushing syndrome. Early onset, significant dysmorphism, we have to look at genetic studies, including that for uh, possibility of leptin deficiency and neurological features, we have to look at neuroimaging to look for a hypothalamic cause of obesity. So this is a 13 year old girl and we can see it's a classical moon facies, there is some hirsutism, there is a buffalo hump which is indicative of ACTH dependent Cushing syndrome. 8 year old boy and we see that this boy looks obese and if we look carefully his hands are short. There is uh, eyes are uh, almond shaped and this is a classical picture of Padavili syndrome. Importantly Padavili syndrome associated with hypotonia, rapid weight gain, enormous appetite and they respond very well to injectable growth hormone as far as improvement in body composition is concerned. This child short and plump child with micro penis undescended testis is a classical case of growth hormone deficiency. If you have a child with obesity and polydactyly, think of Lawrence Mool Beetle Bartlett syndrome associated with retinitis pigmentosa and renal disease. This is a rare situation but a potentially therapeutic one, a child with massive obesity born out of a consanguineous family, the first reported case of leptin deficiency responded dramatically to leptin therapy with improvement in appetite and body composition. So now we know about the cause of obesity, the next question is what is the effect of obesity and in most cases of constitutional obesity it's the effect which makes more difference than really the cause because cause is not very well elaborated in most cases. So obesity affects every which part of the body starting from the head to toe. We particularly are concerned about dyslipidemia. Type 2 diabetes is now noted around 5% cases polycystic ovarian syndrome and steatohepatitis but it is associated with lot of complications including risk of malignancies, pseudotumor cerebri, skeletal problems like uh, slipped capital femoral emphasis which are quite important. So it is really a ticking time bomb as far as pediatric obesity is concerned. So how do we assess for that? Look at acanthosis and blood pressure to look for possibility of metabolic syndrome. Snoring, daytime somnolence, lethargy, poor school concentration may indicate towards obstructive sleep apnea. Headache may be a marker of benign intracranial hypertension and limp in an otherwise stable child. And this is a very important pointer which should not be missed. If a child was fine, suddenly has a limp, think of a possibility of slipped capital femoral epiphysis because this could have significant impact on long term health of that child. We also need to be cautious that certain situations which look pathological in a child with obesity are not really pathological. So if, if they often come with complaints of micro penis, but if you actually suppress the suprapubic fat, it's actually buried penis and not micro penis. Girls with, pre, with obesity often come with complaints of precocious puberty, but it's actually lipomastia and not true breast enlargement. And if you really approximate your thumb and finger, close to the breast tissue, you will find there is no breast nodule, it is just fat. Often because of the obesity, there could be genovalgum giving an appearance of rickets. So we do not need to be over cautious in this regards. Certain evaluations have to be done in terms of obese child, we have to do an oral glucose tolerance test using a blood sugar at a 0 hour and after 1.75 grams per kilogram, 2 hours later sugar which is diagnostic as far as glucose intolerance is concerned. Look at uh, alkaline uh, SGPT level, the ALT level, which are marker of fatty liver disease, lipid profile as marker of dyslipidemia. And what we need to understand is that insulin 
is of limited role. We tend to do a lot of insulin fasting and 2R values. These values are highly variable. Insulin are the labile hormone, depends upon a lot of factors. So, it is actually a waste of money doing insulin routinely in all these cases, unless we are doing a research study in that regards. And I would just go briefly in this regard that we need to be careful in terms of interpreting the values as far as the lab parameters are concerned because most reports mention the adult values and they are not relevant for children. Particularly when we are talking about total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol and triglyceride levels, we should use pediatric cutoffs of both concern and pathology. So now we have a 15 year old girl who presented with polyuria, blood sugar was 320, BMI was 28, so the child is obese, has acanthosis, and the family history of mother and grandfather. So what's the diagnosis? This is a clear cut case of type 2 diabetes which we are encountering more often in children with obesity but we need to remember that childhood obesity and type 2 diabetes is a very aggressive disease and in this landmark trial. It has been shown that there is a significant failure as far as beta cell function is concerned in these individuals and 25% fall of beta cell function happens every year in adolescents with obesity and type 2 diabetes as compared to 7 to 10% which was noted as far as the adults were concerned and we need to be more cautious. There is a very rapid burnout in this. So the aim of treatment in a child with obesity is not really very rapid weight loss because if you lose a lot of weight, it will affect the growth and development of the child and it may not be sustainable over a period of time. So the goal is actually weight stabilization with a weight loss of approximately around 1 kilogram per month being reasonable option in most cases to ensure that there is normal growth and the key target is actually to reduce the BMI standard deviation score over follow-up. So the key thing that we can do is uh, in the form of uh, advising the food pyramid that no particular food item is actually banned. It has to be taken in modest amount and to ensure that the child actually has regular meals, does not skip breakfast, avoidance of snacking, use water as a prominent drink and most importantly not watching television while eating. These parameters are absolutely important and can go a long way in improving the dietary intake of that child. Lifestyle modification should include regular physical activity and reducing the time of inactivity including television, mobile, laptops, tablets to less than one hour per day and reducing screen time. Medical treatment of obesity is quite difficult. The only drug which is probably indicated in children at the moment is Orlistat which has a mild effect of a few kilograms here and there. Metformin is of a role if there is insulin resistance, if there is pre-diabetes, fatty liver disease or polycystic ovarian syndrome. Bariatric surgery is the last resort but it is a difficult procedure. Mostly laparoscopic banding is recommended for children with modest success. It's however the most effective therapy in children who have severe morbid obesity. There are roles of GLP-1 agonist and cannabinoid-1 receptor antagonist which may come up in children over some period of time. So therefore the prevention of childhood obesity becomes extremely important and in that regard it should start from infancy. Children should be exclusively breastfed in the six months of life. Most importantly not to force feed them but provide them with free food twice. Avoid television viewing by two years of age. During childhood screen time should be limited to less than one hour. Use of low fat milk, regular physical activity. And during adolescence, planned activity, healthy eat out and reduce in activity will go a long way in improving outcome as far as obesity is concerned. So, as far as childhood obesity is concerned, unnecessary tests should be avoided. Children should not be given thyroxine if the TSH is marginally elevated and over-restrictive diet and lifestyle pattern should be avoided. We should assess regularly the growth, blood pressure and puberty of the child. Work up short and plump child for possibilities of uh, significant pathologies and screen for complications.